we have. Thank you very much. Somebody started the recording. So everybody don't forget this is recorded so that we can put up the lectures later on for others. Um, please ask your questions in the chat so I can monitor it and not on a Slack, but do have afterwards discussions in the different Slack channels and the lecturers will jump in and you know, answer your questions and also follow along. This is gonna be a very discussion heavy uh, part. So I highly encourage you to like actively participate and, and look at the collab as well. Um, so now we're going to have the last hands on section by Ryan McDonald and by Natasha Batella, and they're going to talk about the theoretical atmospheric models. So everything, it's basically everything, radiative transfer, cross sections, line lists, everything you need that we haven't talked about up until here. So I'm going to leave uh, the floor to Ryan. Thank you very much for the, uh, the introduction there, Julia. And yeah, and as you say, uh, Natasha and I were given the uh, simple task of summarizing all of atmosphere theory. Um, we, we have one hour, 50 minutes for this, uh, but we're gonna be breaking it apart into many different parts. So uh, I will be talking about, just trying to give an overview of all of the ingredients that go into model spectra of exoplanet atmospheres. So in previous talks, we've seen, for example, templates at high resolution. Where do these templates come from? What is the physics and chemistry that goes into them? Um, at low resolution when it comes to retrievals, um, what are the equations that are actually being solved to compute those spectra? We'll be looking at uh, that today. And uh, th so there are three parts where we're going to switch over to um, some collabs that Natasha Battaglia has uh, kindly uh, made. So uh, the first one we'll switch to in about 25 minutes or so. So if you haven't already opened the collabs and you'd like to follow along, um, please do follow the link that uh, Natasha posted in the Slack channel. Um, because there's there's one collab that you need to run in advance just to download things like the opacity database. And because it's six gigabytes in size, it will probably take about 15 minutes for you to download. So if you want to, to follow along, um, by all means, just as I'm starting my talk, please get that one up and then just click on the cells to get that one started. OK, so without further ado, let's uh, dive in to see what goes into spectra of exoplanet atmospheres. So. As we've already heard in a number of talks, there are multiple ways that we have to probe exoplanet atmospheres. So here I'm showing the, the geometry from an observer's perspective of a standard transiting planet. Um, these are not just restricted to transiting planets, though. And so we've seen a lot of talks where we've seen about transmission spectra and emission spectra. And you can also have um, phase dependent emission and reflection that you can observe as well. And if you have a non-transiting planet observed at high resolution, you can also, for example, see the emission spectrum from the planet, um, kind of digging out those spectral lines from the spectrum of the star. So if we rotate our geometry so that we're looking down on the star and planet system here, one of the most crucial things to realize when it comes to the different techniques of probing exoplanet atmospheres is that different observing geometries tell you different information about the planet and probe different regions. So in transmission geometry, we're observing stellar rays which are going in through the day side of a tidal locked planet, passing through the day-night terminator region and emerging from the night side. While in eclipse geometry, we're observing the combination of thermal emission from the day side of the planet just before it passes behind its host star from our line of sight. And if you're looking at optical wavelengths, there's also a component from reflected starlight. And so we're now going to build some simple toy models to get intuition for how, what kind of physics is encoded in these different geometries. And then we're going to step and build together more realistic models. So firstly, a toy model of transmission spectra. So on the left here is a cartoon sketch from an observer's perspective as a planet passes in front of a star. The planet has a deep radius RP and an atmosphere of height H. So if we look at this detrended light curve model on the right here, the flux outside of the transit is just given by the intensity of the star. Uh, we'll define intensity more rigorously in a few slides. But imagine for simplicity that we are neglecting limb darkening so that the star is just a uniform surface with the same intensity being emitted towards us 
um, at every region of the disk. So the intensity of the star's surface times by the emitting area of the surface divided by the distance to the observer squared gives you the flux that we observe at Earth. In transit, we have a slightly lower flux because we lose a contribution from the planetary disk obscuring the stellar surface. So we lose a contribution weighted by the atmosphere of, sorry, the, um, the disk area of the planet. So the transit depth here, neglecting limb darkening, which is just the difference in the flux between um, outside of transit and inside of transit, divided by the outside transit flux, is then simply just the ratio of the area of the planet to the area of the star. So the stellar intensity nicely cancels out. So if you imagine observing at a wavelength where the entire atmosphere is completely transparent, we can then just pretend that the height of the atmosphere is zero at that wavelength. And then you just have RP over R star squared. While at a wavelength where the atmosphere is completely opaque in this toy model, we gain an additional contribution coming in from the area of the annulus of the atmosphere. And if you neglect this, uh, this term here, which is small, then we can see that the contribution of an atmosphere is just roughly given by, it's directly proportional to the size of the atmosphere, which will depend on properties like the temperature of the atmosphere, the mean molecular weight and the gravity via the scale height. Um, but the atmospheric term is also inversely proportional to the stellar radius. So this is why, for example, small stars are fantastic targets to try and obtain transmission spectra of terrestrial planets. So James Webb, for example, will be looking at many rocky planets around M stars like the TRAPPIST-1 system because of this dependence on the inverse squared radius of the star. So this is a simplistic toy model for transmission spectra, solely assuming that an atmosphere is either 100% transparent or 100% opaque. For emission spectra, we can also construct a simple toy model. So now from the observer's perspective, we have a planet that is just about to pass behind its star. So in this case, the flux outside of the eclipse is given by the flux that we see from the stellar disk, plus the thermal and reflected flux from the planet's day side. Inside of, inside of the eclipse, sorry, we can't see the planet anymore, so we just have the flux from the star. So the eclipse depth is then basically just the ratio between the planet flux and the star flux assuming that uh, the ratio between them is sufficiently small. So if, if we now neglect the contribution of reflected light, so imagine that we're looking in the infrared, and we assume that both the planet and the star emit as black bodies, uh, given by the Planck function here, then the planet and the star flux is just given by the Planck function, weighted by the area of the planet or the star, divided by the distance to the observer squared. So the eclipse depth is just given by uh, this term here with two Planck functions. And at long wavelengths, if you, um, in the Rayleigh genes limit, you can expand out these two exponentials and you find that essentially the eclipse depth generally tends to increase with wavelengths eventually asymptoting towards this value here. So we see that for planets which are cooler than their star, which describes most planets, uh, there are some exceptions though, um, the eclipse depth will always be smaller than the transit depth because of this extra factor here. And so eclipse depths are a little bit tougher to observe for a given signal to noise ratio than for transmission spectra. Okay, so these are our toy models. Now, if we want to build a more realistic model of exoplanet spectra, like the kinds that we have seen in previous talks, there are a number of considerations. So for example, in transmission geometry that we see here, we see a ray going in through the atmosphere, and as the ray propagates through the atmosphere, the density of the gases in the atmosphere should increase until you reach the lowest altitude probed by the ray, called the impact parameter, and then the density should decrease on the second leg of the ray's journey. 
The temperature can also vary in the atmosphere with altitude and also with longitude and latitude for three dimensional models. And the chemistry or the composition can also vary in the atmosphere. So there is a lot going on in the atmosphere. So we can't just get away with assuming the atmosphere is either completely transparent or completely opaque. In reality, how strongly different layers absorb will depend on where in the three dimensional atmosphere they are. So to be able to encode the physics of how light interacts with the matter in the atmosphere, we need to delve into the subject of radiative transfer. This is an absolutely huge field, and it's the subject of like a whole course, so I won't be able to do all of radiative transfer justice just here, but I at least want to give you a, a taste of the key quantities in radiative transfer and how we can solve them for transmission and emission spectra. So, okay, so just to define the two key quantities in radiative transfer. Imagine, for example, that you have a beam of light. This could be visible light, infrared, um, whatever that is traveling in a direction specified by this unit vector m. We can imagine the beam as a cone with solid angle d omega passing through a differential surface here. So this could be a surface um, at the top of the atmosphere, for example, and the beam is propagating outwards. So we can now define a quantity called the intensity. So essentially, the intensity just tells you how much energy is flowing through that surface area dA carried by this beam with a given solid angle per wavelength per time. And there is this extra factor here, which is uh, just um, projecting the beam onto the unit vector of the surface. This is just saying that, for example, if the beam is traveling perpendicular to the surface, then zero energy will be transported through that area. So the reason why we care about this quantity intensity is that it has a really nice property that if you have a beam in a vacuum, the intensity is constant along the beam. So we don't have to worry about things like the inverse square dependence that you would get from considering power or energy, for example. So intensity is a very nice quantity, but at least for exoplanets that we can't spatially resolve, we can't really observe the intensity of particular patches of the atmosphere. So instead we deal with flux that we saw in the toy models, but is rigorously defined as the integral of the projected intensity over all solid angles that are emitting or traveling through a surface. So now that these are defined, we can now think about how any medium will modify the intensity of a beam. So we have, you can imagine a cylinder, for example, of gas with a length ds, and as light travels through it, its intensity will change. We can summarize very generally how this intensity changes just via two quantities. The first is called the extinction coefficient. This encodes any process that um, removes photons from the beam. So this, for example, could be an atom or molecule absorbing a particular photon at a given wavelength. It could be a molecule scattering a photon outside of the beam so that we then no longer see it. Any process that removes photons, so we don't see them anymore. And the loss of intensity from extinction will also be proportional to the intensity going into the slab of matter, because if you send more photons into the matter, they will, on average, um, interact more with molecules that are absorbing or scattering light. And so hence, the amount of intensity lost is proportional to the amount of intensity that goes in and the length of the medium. We can also have processes that contribute photons into our beam. And this is encoded by the emission coefficient epsilon. So for example, this could be thermal emission so radiating and adding new photons into our beam. You could also have processes that scatter photons into our beam. So we gain photons via that mechanism. So we can then just combine this loss and gain term. And there you have it, the radiative transfer equation, at least in one particular form, which looks deceptively simple because there are a lot of physical processes encoded
in kappa and epsilon here. And um, yeah, radial transfer can get very complicated when you add scattering in particular, because then there's directional dependence and it all becomes very chaotic. So we're just going to be looking at some simple one dimensional solutions to this equation, neglecting um, scattering into the beam. So now if we introduce two fundamental quantities that are commonly used in radial transfer, the first is known as the optical depth, which is just the integral of the extinction coefficient along the, um, the direction that the beam is traveling. Uh, incidentally, um, to give you some physical intuition for what the extinction coefficient kappa actually is, it's just one divided by the mean free path of a photon, essentially. So it tells you how far photons can travel on average before being absorbed or scattered. So tau, the optical depth, is just the integral of that over the distance that is traveled. And we can also define something called the source function, which is just the ratio between the emission coefficient and the extinction coefficient. So with these two definitions, we can just divide the radial transfer equation by kappa, and then we can rewrite the equation solely in terms of the optical depth and the source function. So if we have an atmosphere which satisfies a condition known as local thermodynamic equilibrium, so this is where if you have an individual small localized area of the atmosphere, which has a constant temperature, then essentially the, the emission coefficient is just the absorption coefficient, so the extinction coefficient times by the Planck function, uh, the black body function that we see there. So uh, this, is a, this is a pretty decent approximation for, and is using the vast majority of atmosphere models. Uh, it does tend to break down, especially in the upper atmosphere of planets. But for the typical pressures that we tend to probe, especially in low resolution transmission and emission spectra, LTE is a pretty good approximation. So in this case, we can just replace the source function with the black body function here. And this is the form of the equation of radial transfer that is most often solved for um, simple transmission and emission spectra neglecting scattering into the beam. So with this, we can now build a more advanced model of transmission spectra. So in transmission geometry, we actually don't have any emission into the beam. If we neglect, um, if we assume, for example, that any photons that are scattered leave the beam, and that uh, since it's such a very narrow range of angles that can still reach the observer, we're going to assume here that any processes that scatter photons into the beam are negligible. So in this case, we can drop the source function and we then have a very easy equation that can be integrated and solved. So this tells us that the intensity that leaves the atmosphere is just the instant intensity exponentially attenuated by the optical depth along the path. And the optical depth will depend, for example, on the impact parameter of a given ray, because if a ray probes deeper altitudes in the atmosphere, as we'll see in a couple of slides time, the optical depth will be much, much higher due to the greater path length, just from Pythagoras here, and uh, the higher number density of the atmosphere increases the amount of absorption. So you can then show that thinking back to our toy model, that instead of imagining that we have just one slab of gas, an annulus that is completely opaque, you can then imagine progressively having annuli of atmosphere that you integrate over. So then the area of an annulus is just two pi times by the impact parameter times by the differential impact parameter. So two pi b dB. And then you weight that by the fraction of light that is absorbed at a given wavelength, which is just one minus e to the minus tau. And so the first term in this equation here just tells you, it's just what we had from our toy model. So the opaque disk of the atmosphere absorbing equally at all wavelengths. The second term gives you the additional absorption from each annulus of atmosphere as you work out. And the third term is a correction factor accounting for um, if it turns out that RP is not actually opaque at all wavelengths, that lets you correct for any wavelengths where the atmosphere is still slightly transparent below the radius of the planet. So it's a fun exercise to try and derive this equation purely from this qualitative statement here. 
But if you're if you want to see the derivation from first principles, the appendix of this paper that I wrote a few years ago um, will derive this equation for you from this geometry. And so this is the equation that is normally solved for numerical transmission spectrum models, um, and it's used in um, pretty much all retrieval codes, for example. So yeah, radio transfer perhaps is not that scary in the case of transmission spectra. For emission spectra, there are a few extra complexities because we also have this contribution from thermal emission in the atmosphere. And the geometry is a little bit different. So the optical depth in the case of emission spectra is usually defined instead of the optical depth integrated along the direction of a beam, it's usually defined so it's in the vertical direction. And so this just means that you have to, the, the vertical optical depth is just the optical depth we were thinking about before times by cosine of theta, basically. And the reason that this is done this way is because for emission spectra, we can have different beams traveling at different directions to the normal, as shown in this cartoon sketch on the right here. So in this particular case, the equation of radio transfer becomes slightly different. We get this extra factor of mu, the cosine of theta coming in, because the definition of optical depth is different. And the sine also changes, because by convention, the optical depth is defined to be zero at the top of the atmosphere. So if you imagine we're looking down at the atmosphere, we see zero optical depth at the top, and the optical depth increases as we look deeper into the atmosphere. So there's this extra minus sign compared to what we are working with for transmission spectra. But you can still actually generally come up with a solution to this equation, so long as we're neglecting scattering. Um, in this particular case, um, you multiply by an integrating factor, and you can then show that the total intensity emerging from the top of the atmosphere at an angle mu to the local normal is just given by this integral here. And since what we see at the end of the day is the flux, we can just integrate over all of the um, all of the angles uh, theta or equivalently mu. And this is the equation that is usually used to compute the flux of a planet observed um, seen by an observer. So if you have a directly imaged planet, for example, this is where you can stop. Uh, this will just be the flux that you observe. Um, if instead you're observing in secondary eclipse, you then need to divide this by the flux of the star seen by the observer. So, um, so there you have it. These are the equations that are generally solved in many forward models and retrieval models. There's a lot more extra complexity that you can add. I, I've explicitly mentioned that scattering has been neglected in these derivations because scattering is horrible and makes our life a lot harder. Um, but just with these, this simple picture here, this describes a lot of models that are used in, um, to interpret real observations. So the very last thing I'm gonna mention before we switch to our first exercise with Natasha is that we've seen in both transmission and emission that the fundamental quantity we need to work out is the optical depth, tau. So how do we actually do this? Because we've just described the extinction coefficient qualitatively up to date here. So there are many different atmospheric processes that go into the extinction coefficient. And in part two of our talk, we're going to look at each of these in turn. But if we just focus on the first of these terms, which is the absorption due to uh, atoms, molecules, and ions, essentially this is just a sum over the number density of each particular chemical species, which in turn is just the total number density of the atmosphere times by a quantity called the mixing ratio. So this is just a number, it varies from zero to one. So it tells you, for example, 90% of the atmosphere is hydrogen, 10% is helium, for example. And we will see in the third part of our talk how for an atmospheric model, the number density is calculated. And this sigma here is called the absorption cross-section, which we've already encountered in previous talks and we will review in the second part. So all of the actual calculation of the extinction coefficients is where you, the actual model of the atmosphere itself is defined. So we have to create a model atmosphere. We can then calculate the extinction coefficients in each layer. Then we can calculate the optical depth 
integrating depending on whether the geometry is vertical or slant geometry, and that then gives us our spectrum. So uh, now for our first tutorial, we're going to take a look to get some intuition for how transmission and emission spectra change depending on temperature, and in particular, how we know what the mixing ratios will be in the atmosphere. So essentially the chemistry of the atmosphere, how do we determine that? So I'm going to stop sharing at this point and uh, we will uh, hand over to Natasha. Awesome, thanks Ryan. I guess while I'm setting up screen share, does anyone have any questions for Ryan before we go on? This is a warm up exercise in discussing because for the remainder of the of the talks, we hope to to really get you guys thinking and, and chatting and there are no wrong answers so uh, or silly questions. Okay, well, great sounds like everyone is uh, has their radiative transfer understood. Uh, can everyone see my screen? Awesome. Cool. So as Ryan just gave a great intro into the beginnings of radiative transfer and an, an awesome segue at the end showing how the mixing ratio gets folded into the computation of the opacity or the, the optical depth of the atmosphere. And so we figured in this very first component um, we kind of go through and try and give you an intuition for sort of what types of planets are going to have what kinds of mixing ratios. Um, and this general intuition, I think, is it's when I when I first started working in sort of exoplanet atmosphere science was one of the first exercises that um, my advisor, who, who I was working with at the time, Mike Klein, gave me. Um, and it really helped to build my intuition because if you can sort of recall the types of molecules or the types of spectral features that you'll expect to see in, let's say, a you know 400 Kelvin planet, it'll really help you in um, you know just going into reading literature, reading papers, and things like that. Um, so that's what we're going to do in this very first um, in this very first section. And I guess I should ask via if if people can either raise their hands and give me an idea of. Um, if you were able to get the collab working or if you have Picasso installed, it'll just, um, if you don't, that's totally fine. And I can, um, I'll just be a little bit more interactive in how I'm running things. Um, and, and it'll just change how I show people figures and things like that. So I'm not seeing anyone raise their hand. So it sounds like, oh, I see one thumbs up. I, I managed to download everything. Everything worked fine. It took five minutes. Okay. Maybe Anna okay, says cool. in the chat that it also worked for her. So. Okay, great. Good. Awesome. Cool. Um, so mine is going to be a little bit different than the collab. Um, I'm just running locally. So the very first thing so that you're going to see is Picasso has these two. And I'm sorry to switch up radiative transfer codes. So you got a flavor for petite rad trans yes, or today, which is great. Um, as you'll see, one of the things that you should have taken away from the lecture earlier is how gravity shapes transmission and emission spectra and also how the pressure temperature profile shapes the spectra as well. Um, as you'll see in one of the very first things that we're doing, we're going to fix gravity. And so I'm going to kind of keep that as a constant so we can sort of build an intuition in other locations. Um, the very first thing that you're going to do when in any sort of radiative transfer code is, is pulling up this cross-section connection. Um, or this cross-section database. So Petit Red Trans has one as well. Um, the one that you'll be using today is one that I've created for these demos. Um, it is a what's called a resampled cross-section. So you start with a line-by-line -line database that is computed on a resolution of about a million. Um, now, if I were to try and hand off a resolution of a million database for seven, several molecules, you'll, you'd end up having to download something that was you know, half a terabyte or more. Um, and so what we can do is we can actually just resample that. Um, but what that means is you're effectively taking every other, every tenth, uh, one of those line by line points. And so when you ultimately go and compute your um, model that you want to compare to observations, you need to um, 
bin that bin your um, theoretical model down to about an R of 100 or 100 times lower um, than what that resampled opacity database is. And so you'll see throughout this tutorial that when we go and plot out um, our spectra, we're always sort of bidding down to R of 150. And that's the reason why we're doing that. Um, and right now I'm just taking a wavelength range of one to 14 microns, but you can sort of slice and dice this. The less uh, wavelength range that you choose, the faster your code will be. And so um, that is really the only reason why you would want to change this is just to sort of speed up the, speed up the code. Um, so we're going to dive right in. And, and the first thing that I like to do is sort of just ground ourselves in observations of, of planets that do exist. Uh, there is this, this function with, within Picasso, which just queries the Nexi database and grabs the, um, the, all the relevant planets um, from the Nexi database. And so it returns this, um, this data frame here of, of and, and this might look familiar to you because it's all of the same column names as, as, as is on the Nexi database. And so the first thing that I'm doing is just taking um, everything with a mass and an equilibrium temperature, and I'm dropping everything else. Uh, and sometimes this is, if you're actually planning observations, something, sometimes this isn't a great thing to do because uh, the Nexi database notoriously often has equilibrium temperatures missing and sometimes even mass is missing. And so when you do this, you might drop some of your favorite planets as well. Uh, but it's, it kind of gives you a great idea for sort of what's available on a first pass. You can always go back and sort of refine. Uh, so when you do this, you'll get a plot that looks like this. Here I'm just plotting out sort of a scatter plot of the planets that do have masses and equilibrium temperatures. And you can see that sort of most of our most of the exoplanets that are known to date um, or, or that have measure masses kind of fall in this region from about you know 500 Kelvin up to about 2000. And up here you have uh, the, the famous KELT-9 super hot Jupiter that's up at 4000 Kelvin. We're going to neglect that for today. We're going <laughs> we're going to stop right here at around 2000, 2000 Kelvin and sort of gain an intuition for planets that range in temperatures from about, you know, 100 Kelvin or so all the way up to about 2000 Kelvin. Um, yeah, 2500. Um, so the first thing that I'm doing is I'm just setting a temperature range to compute. This is super simple and you can, you know, you can play around with what you want to compute. You can really, you know, create a very super fine grid of, of spectra that you want to run or not. Um, the, so these I'm just going to create 10 models of 10 different temperatures ranging from 100 to, uh, to 2,500. Um, the first thing right off the bat that you have to do in sort of any model atmosphere comparison is sort of set up the very basic planet properties. So the, the, the two things that we're going to just fix throughout this are the star and the gravity. Um, and, and the gravity, you should have gotten some great intuition for that previously today. Uh, and the star is going to sort of fix, it's, is, as Ryan described, going to set the transit depth height. Um, and it's also going to set the relative, if we're ever looking at uh, the planet flux relative to the star flux, it's also going to set that as well. But today we're just going to fix those and focus sort of on the chemistry and the opacities from, from, the, from the models themselves. Um, so just a, a 101 in Picasso, the very first thing to do is just um, set this input directory uh, and then you can sort of set your, your, your star and planet properties always using astropy units because everyone hates units. So astropy units sort of solves that problem for you. Um, and then the, what I'm doing is I'm running through this temperature loop. And at every instance of that, I'm calling this Sonora function. And the Sonora function is pulling a pressure temperature profile from a grid of previously computed profiles. And so this isn't a parameterized profile as you were playing around with earlier. This was something that Mark Marley and his team computed um, using sort of a self-consistent code, including a chemical sort of a chemical equilibrium model that was computed by Shannon Bisher. And so at each one of these instances, it's assuming that this temperature that we're putting in is an effective temperature. And then it's grabbing a pressure temperature profile based on the gravity and the effective temperature. It's setting the chemistry 
and then it's going to go ahead and compute both the thermal emission spectra and a transmission spectra. And here I'm just telling it to give us all of the output. Um, and so the first thing, this is we've arrived at our first sort of fundamental figure here. Um, so here at the top, I'm showing the transmission spectra. And here at the bottom, I'm showing the thermal emission. This is the, uh, this is the, actually I labeled this relative, but I'm uh, plotting the actual, this is the raw flux, which is a little bit easier, um, a, a little bit easier to, to digest. Um, so the first question that I'll, that I'll sort of bounce to the audience is, as you're looking at this transition from sort of cooler objects or cooler spectra up to the hotter spectra, what are just sort of some of the by eye transitions that you see in spectral features? I'll give everyone a moment to sort of stare at this. We can sort of start by staring just at this. The, there's one really obvious one that, that might be visible to folks. Again, it doesn't have to be right, everybody. Yeah. You can I mean, either really just obvious. Sorry. Very good. Okay. Good. I just wanted to say you can either like directly unmute yourself, or you can also raise your hand if you're a bit shy, and then I, I call you. I was just going to say it's really obvious, but you see that the sort of continuum transit depth just increases with the temperature. Yeah, um, that's great. Yeah, so we we fixed the the um, we fixed the radius and we fixed the we fixed the gravity, the radius and the, the stellar temperature. But yeah, that is sort of um, increasing. What else? What else from a molecular standpoint? And one way to kind of help you do that is to pick a pick a feature. Um, and I'll one that one that we're actually you know very potentially accustomed to seeing is the water feature at 1.4 microns. Um, and so following this water feature, there's actually not much difference that you see going. The one thing that you'll notice is just sort of the magnitude of the feature is changing maybe. So if we kind of scroll, but if we scroll and kind of zoom in. We're still maybe seeing water here, but potentially the introduction of something else. And I'm going to move over to a region where you might see a little bit more activity. So let's look here. So now um, here's water again, but as you as you kind of go into cooler objects, specifically here we're starting to see the introduction of another molecule, right? This peak right here has been introduced and it previously wasn't there at our hottest temperature objects, right? And if I scroll out completely, you can kind of, you can really see that yeah. popping yeah. up. Yeah. Um, you can really see that kind of popping up and transitioning from sort of the hottest things down to the coolest things. Anything else? I think that's probably the, what about in the emission spectra? Again, what is the sort of the, the fundamental zeroth order? Uh, what is changing? Jens is asking what happened to CO at 2.35 microns. <laughs> well, sorry, what was that? Jens is asking in the chat, where's the CO feature 2.35 microns? Oh, oh, oh. Well, there's definitely the CO feature that's popping in right there. Um, do we see it? Actually, when we get to, um, we're gonna we're gonna plot out some uh, contribution functions later on, and you'll be able to see the C, the full CO contribution function. And so we'll, um, that will be a great, uh, that will be great to see. 
to see later on. It's a little bit harder to see here. Okay, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on. Um, the so for the for the emission and Ryan, um, let me know on <laughs> let me know on timing um, when you want to switch back over to the second lecture part. Sure, I think after you've uh, shown the plot of the mixing ratios, that'll be good. Okay, great. Um, cool. So the it. I, th I think one of the one of the main points from just looking at these spectra is maybe people have like a little bit of shock from just seeing so many spectra, you know, you, it, especially if you're not used to looking at these right off the bat, it's a little bit hard to digest. Um, and so one of the things that we're going to be doing uh, moving forward is looking at these sort of contribution functions and and getting an and getting an intuition for how to sort of break down these model outputs. Uh, so one of the first things that you can do if you're given a model, if you're given a series of models and sort of any sort of radio transfer code that you use is gonna have options to do this, is sort of look at the output or look at the input, look at what you physically put into the model. And so here I am taking our 100 Kelvin run, which I've just stored in a dictionary uh, and, and showing you sort of the data frame of mixing ratios that went into this run. And so these are all of the mixing ratios that we're accounting for um, as a function of pressure and temperature. Um, and you can see in this sort of data frame, um, in this dictionary here, you can see all the other sort of output products that come along with this. There's pressure and temperature because each of these things are a function of those. Um, there is the mean molecular weight of all of these different things and the column density and, and sort of cloud output, though at this point we're still assuming cloud free. Um, and so you can see right off the bat, there's like 38 molecules within this run. This is something that, that is somewhat of a mismatch of that when the chemical equilibrium codes are computed and then given those models to the radiative transfer. And this is something you'll have to be careful about. It sort of is understanding what molecules you're actually inputting into your, um, into your op opacity database. Um, and so if I pull up the um the opacity database that i gave you all um there are only a certain set of molecules in there and so even though it looks the chemical uh, model is returning 38 different molecules we're only really accounting for the this set um in our model and i see a question from nicholas uh yeah i was i was, I was looking back at the um the graph for a bit longer um yeah. and I one of the features uh, is that as you increase temperature, the spectrum um, basically starts to look like a black body um, irradiation. Like, you know, it like a black body. Um, and I was kind of just wanting to know why that is. Yeah. The, so um, one of the one of the very interesting things that you can do. Um, so as we is first of all, I'm going to I'm going to actually take the the last plot that we did, the last model that we did, I think was the hot, um, the hot case. Let me just verify. So here I'm just plotting, I'm, I just wanted to show the pressure temperature profile that we input. Um, when you're looking at sort of, um, when you're looking at thermal emission spectra, um, the, the way that you should really interpret that is thinking of the, op, the tau one curve. So where you're becoming optically thick and optically thin sort of moving up and down the pressure temperature profile. And so in when we're looking at these very cool objects, 
the reason why you're seeing these huge variations in spectral features is you're becoming optically thin and optically thick um, along where you where you have this absorption. And, and, and so you have these windows, you have these periods of windows um, where you're very optically thin, you move way down in, in, in the atmosphere and you become hotter and that gives rise to more flux, okay? And then when you become optically thick towards a spectral feature, you become, you move up, you become cooler and you move down and you, you, you get less flux. Um, in our hotter cases where we're going to see, we're going to start looking at sort of these optical contribution flux, there's a lot of opacity. Um, and when, uh, and so we're not, we're not sort of probing um, huge variations along this temperature pressure profile. And therefore, when you look at this curve here, um, this, these differences in, that you're seeing are sort of, um, are, are, are going to be less than these multi, you know, order of magnitude, um, cooler temperature uh, planets. Cool. Um, so here we have the, so we plotted out the mixing ratios. We have these 38 molecules, um, but I was telling you that really these are the molecules that we're going to be focusing on uh, in this, in, in here, although it's good to sort of see, um, experience sort of look at these temperature transitions or look at these transitions in the, in the abundances anyway. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these, take this data frame of mixing ratios as a function of temperature. Um, and I'm going to get out sort of the top 10 in each of these molecules. I'm going to get out the top 10, uh, uh highest abundance highest abundance molecules. And we're going to look at that as a function of temperature to sort of see these temperature transitions happening. Um, and so that is what I'm doing here. Uh, and so here I'm plotting, this is the effective temperature of the system that we plotted. Here is the abundance. And so I will let everyone sort of stare at this for a little bit. And this is gonna be the last thing that we do until Ryan, Ryan takes it away further. Um, so this is again, sort of at first pass, really hard to digest. There's a lot of stuff going on. Uh, and so we can sort of break this down into different categories. The, the first thing to look for is just what are, what are the few molecules that are sort of constant, regardless of what temperature you have, you kind of always see them. There should be, you know, around three or four. I see in the chat, Nicola says helium, and then Julia H2 and pH3. Nice, yeah. So those are all, so pH3, yep, you can see right here, phosphine is sort of always, um, so always kind of kicking around. We also have water. You can see water is always kind of constant. It's, it's at low temperatures and it's at high temperatures. And then of course, uh, hydrogen, helium um, are, are also actually, uh, there's, there's H2. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's the first one to notice and water is gonna be super important um, because it's, it's always gonna kind of ground <laughs> uh, it's always going to sort of ground, uh, ground our, our, the shape of a lot of our spectral features. So the next thing to, to sort of pay attention to is the carbon bearing species. And these are going to pop up, especially because they have these huge row vibrational modes that we're used to seeing with a lot of the instruments that we see. And there's a lot of interesting stuff that happens um, within this temperature re regime for sort of our main carbon bearing species. Here, the ones that I'm showing are C2H6, methane, CO, and CO2. So what do you see sort of, um, the question that I've specifically asked is which molecules are good temperature indicators? 
But where do you see sort of these transition occurrings or at what temperature do you see some of these um, molecular transitions occurring? And what is the transition that you observe? So I see someone in the chat is calling out 700K. So that's at around right here-ish. So that, that is a good one. You see CO2, which was previously not around at all at lower temperatures, starts to kind of kick up its, um, its abundance right at around 700K. And then the other, what is happening with, um, with carbon monoxide and methane? Yeah, so at around 1200 or, you know, just at around this thousand, you know, Kelvin mark, the CO drops like a cliff and the methane also drops and then the methane drops towards higher temperatures. And so this is one thing that, um, this, is, this is one thing that can ground you immediately. If you're looking at really hot objects, you just shouldn't see a lot of methane. Um, you should be primarily looking at CO, CO2 um, whereas when you're looking at primarily cool objects, you should be really focused on the, the methane. Um, yeah, cool. So there, I think that I'm, I'm kind of cognizant of timing here. Um, there are the other, there are some other sort of, we, we already pointed out phosphine. Um, TiO2 is not in the opacity database. And I, in fact, I am not, totally sure that it's in this data frame, though. Um, uh, let me actually, let's check it. one thing. Let's check it out. Oops. Nope. So TiO2 is not in there, at least not in this um, in these chemical equilibrium runs that were computed in Mark's paper. Uh, cool. So the the only other thing that I wanted to point out. So the next question is: besides carbon, what other non non metal based molecules are dominant? So someone already pointed out phosphine. Um, phosphine sort of kind of sticks around regardless of what temperature it is. Uh, the other sort of non-metal that we see is the nitrogens, um, and nitrogens are sim are experiencing sort of, sort of a similar transition as the CO methane. You see the ammonia dropping off very heavily at around 500 Kelvin, and you see the N2 then picking up towards the hotter objects. Um, for the alkali-based molecules, so um, this is just sodium potassium. You can also see they experience a very similar transition where right at around sort of, you know, 700 Kelvin, they all of a sudden turn on and, and you can start seeing them in the spectrum. And we can, if we, if we, well, we'll, we'll get to sort of dissecting them and really, you know, looking for the molecules later on. Um, and then the last question is just to look for the metals. And so here we have iron and aluminum. Um, those are now pop up, pop up like at, at very high temperatures. And so much hotter than this sort of a thousand Kelvin region. And so the reason why I'm having you sort of think like this is that it, it, it really helps to think of now these different chemical transitions. We have one sort of at around 500. We have one at around a thousand where you have this switch in carbon chemistry. And then we have another one at around 2000 where you have now all of these metals um, that start appearing. And so that is sort of getting to this question down here of what these, like, what are these greatest sort of critical temperature transitions that you see um, across all of these different spectrums. 
And I think we will pause there and I will hand it back over to Ryan. Unless, does anyone have any quick questions? Skyla's asking if TIO2 is not modeled. Oh yeah, I think I addressed that. Um, oh, yeah. All so right. I, okay. Okay, well, thank you very much for that uh, great and very in-depth overview there. I think we've got a really good uh, handle of what mixing ratio is to expect now. And just before we get up uh, part two of the talk, which will be shorter than the first part, I just have uh, one uh, quick plot that uh, I would like to, to show to illustrate something about the, uh, the chemistry here. So um, hopefully you can all see this. Uh, this is a, a great plot from um, uh, Gunders et al. 2014. So the mixing ratios that we were seeing previously were all the mixing ratios uh, that you get from solving for what's called um, thermochemical equilibrium. So minimizing the Gibbs free energy of a gas. Uh, for, for real atmospheres, they can of course have disequilibrium effects. So um, in the deep atmosphere at very high temperatures and pressures, chemical equilibrium is a pretty good approximation. Slightly higher in the atmosphere, you can have processes like uh, vertical mixing can drag molecules up from the deep and then enhance their abundances over what would be predicted from equilibrium. So these uh, dashed lines here, like for uh, ammonia in green here and methane in blue, show the chemical equilibrium predictions while the abundances in this region affected by vertical mixing are roughly constant with altitude. Um, and we call that chemical quenching. The abundance is kind of frozen in at the abundance it was at the last point where the time scale of vertical mixing was equal to the um, chemical reaction time scale. And if you go even higher in the atmosphere, then photochemistry from the star can then dissociate molecules. So the methane abundance is then utterly destroyed by photochemistry, while molecules like hydrogen cyanide can actually have their abundances enhanced by photochemistry because they're a byproduct of photolysis from methane. So I just wanted to show this to give an idea that um, although we often use chemical equilibrium in models, um, there's a lot more complexity that you can add for um, to add extra realism. And there are many physical processes that can alter the abundances away from the abundances we were seeing in um, that tutorial. Okay, so on to uh, part two then. Just give me one moment. Okay, so hopefully you can all uh, see my slides again. So now we've seen how the mixing ratios are determined. If we want to be able to calculate the opacity due to molecules now, or the extinction coefficient, I should say, we now need to know what the absorption cross sections are. We touched upon those briefly when uh, Natasha opened up that APACI database. Now we're going to look at where those cross sections actually come from. So just to get some intuition here. So a cross section is effectively telling us the, you can imagine it's the effective area of a molecule. So a molecule with a higher cross section has a greater, greater probability of absorbing a photon at a given wavelength. Here I'm showing an example of a moderate resolution water cross section over the range of wavelengths commonly observed by uh, Hubble with C3. So here we see a forest of absorption lines from the rho vibrational quantum mechanical transitions of the molecule. If we just kind of smooth this for clarity, this, this is more representative of the resolution you would see with the Hubble Space Telescope. Apologies for high resolution people, this must look terrible. However, even at low resolution, you can still distinguish between the absorption bands of different species. And these features do also change with temperature for a reason that we will see on the next slide. So we actually saw a little bit of this in the model spectra that Natasha was showing, that even when we were looking at water features, for example, the mixing ratio of water was very similar in many of those molecules but the shape changed just a little bit because the absorption bands are also sensitive to temperature via the cross sections. So Sid spoke a little bit about uh, this earlier, so I won't go into a lot of depth here about how cross sections are made, 
But essentially, all that they are is it's a sum over all of a huge database of quantum mechanical transitions. Um, there can be millions to hundreds of billions of these transitions. And for every transition, we have what's called the, the line intensity, which tells you how strong a given line absorbs. So this is very high for things like the, the sodium doublet that we heard about yesterday, um, but it can be very low for forbidden transitions, for example. So there are molecules that have lines like uh, molecular hydrogen and nitrogen, but we just don't see them because the line intensity is a very low. And this is multiplied by the line profile that tells us the shape of an absorption line. So real absorption lines are not Dirac delta functions because of phenomena like natural broadening from the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, uh, Doppler broadening from the temperature distribution of the gas, and uh, pressure broadening from collisions between different gas molecules. So if you zoom in at very high resolution to an individual line, normally for cross sections, most lines are treated as Voigt profiles. Uh, the Voigt profile is just a convolution between a Gaussian line profile, uh, shown in purple here, which is what we get from thermal broadening, and a Lorentzian, shown in green, which we get from pressure broadening. So a Voigt profile behaves like a Lorentzian in the line wings, far from the core, and a Gaussian close to the line core. Uh, one of the problems is that you can't actually analytically write down a functional form for the Voigt profile, so it's a little bit more computationally intensive to evaluate because you have to use a special function library, usually from SciPy, to be able to evaluate that. So this is all just to communicate that making cross-sections is a very computationally intensive business. We have to take um, lineless databases that tell us what the line intensities are, um, or properties like the Einstein A coefficients that you can convert to line intensities. And they also tell us what the central wavelength of the transition is. And some of these line lists can be like terabytes in size for molecules like water that can have, um, well, I think the latest water one, what's it? Oh, 10 billion or so lines roughly for something like Pokers Atel. And you can have more than 10 billion. So they can be, the file size can be a big problem. And then you have to compute billions of Voigt profiles and then multiply them and add them. So, and do it for a whole grid of pressures and temperatures. So suffice to say that making a cross section can sometimes take, you know, days to weeks or so, depending on the size of the line list. So that's why we usually pre-compute them and store them in databases, like what we uh, previously used uh, with both um, uh, the database from Petit Bradtrans and the one that uh, Natasha was showing for Picasso. So that's where cross sections actually come from. Uh, we had already heard from some previous talks, especially from Sid, about some of the uncertainties in line lists and how they can modify cross sections. So here I'm showing a nice plot from a recent paper by uh, S. M. Garib Neza, showing that for water, for example, okay, at low resolution in the infrared, line lists like this one from uh, Patrick and Schwenke in 1997, they're not too discrepant from the latest cutting edge. Quantum chemistry pokers eight out line is shown in blue here. So you don't need to, I think we had a, had a question previously about whether we should trust old results. We don't need to throw away every single detection of water in an exoplanet atmosphere just because a new line nest comes out. But what we can see is that there is, there's a big difference in the near UV and the optical range here. And that's due to um, incredible theoretical advancements in quantum chemistry computations over the last uh, couple of decades that have enabled these high energy transitions of the water molecule to be included, which were neglected in some of these uh, older line lists, so the opacity was underestimated. But at high resolution in the bottom panel, then you can see some quite big differences. The line positions can be different. There can be lines that appear in one line list that don't appear in another one. So at high resolution that you would use for your cross correlations, the choice of line lists can matter uh, much more than at low resolution. But actually, even at low resolution for some molecules like TIO shown here, uh, you can get huge differences, especially for uh, cross sections of metal oxides and hydrides. It's really challenging to compute the line lists for these species um, with many, many more electrons flying about doing their things. So this is all just to say that we need to be careful 
with line list choices, especially because once you've made a cross section in your database, it's then fixed for all of your models. So if there is an error that um, you didn't know about in your cross section computation, that doesn't necessarily have to just be that there was an issue with the line list. Um, it could be, for example, that the data you were using for uh, pressure broadening was um, not correct. It's very difficult to do laboratory experiments uh, for many of these species at high temperatures. So it's just worth bearing in mind that residual uncertainties in the cross sections you're using will be propagated into any atmospheric inferences you, that you derive from forward model or retrieval analyses. And in a worst case, like we see here, where the bands can be very different if you're using an old line list, like I've run retrievals, for example, where um, depending on the vanadium oxide line list that you use for an ultra hot Jupiter, even at low resolution, it can change the inference that you get out from a retrieval uh, because the band shapes are different between older and newer line lists. So it's just worth bear bearing in mind what the line lists are that you're using. And fortunately, if you're using uh, great open source packages like Petit Radtrans, for example, um, you'll see in Paul's documentation, all the line lists that are used are transparently listed on the website, which is a really great practice, just so you're aware of what is being used. So besides um, molecular cross sections like we were seeing there, there are these other sources of extinction that we saw in the first part. So one of them that I mentioned is extinction due to Rayleigh scattering which especially in transmission spectra can scatter photons out of your line of sight. So Rayleigh scattering is a continuum opacity that has much more of a pronounced effect at shorter wavelengths, especially in the near UV and the optical. So the Rayleigh scattering cross section is much easier to compute. It's mostly proportional to a wavelength to the, to the minus four, but there are slight deviations coming in from the wavelength dependence of the electric dipole polarizability here, and something called the King correction factor that corrects for the shape of molecules not being spherical. And that's why you see on this log plot, there's a little bit of curvature here that shows that this is deviating at short wavelengths from uh, 10 to the minus four dependence. And we also see that the Rayleigh scattering cross sections for molecules like water and oxygen and nitrogen that are far more important for uh, high metallicity or terrestrial plant atmospheres have stronger Rayleigh scattering cross sections than hydrogen and helium. So if you're modeling planets in this transition region where um, a planet is changing from being hydrogen and helium dominated to water dominated, for example, it's very important to also include the Rayleigh scattering cross sections of things like water. Another important continuum source is um, what I'm, I'm generally just calling these pair process absorption. Uh, but the most common one is called collisionally induced absorption. Essentially, imagine that you have two hydrogen molecules. On their own, hydrogen is pretty transparent to, to light. But two hydrogen molecules that collide with each other can induce a temporary dipole, and that allows a photon to be absorbed. So these processes are actually proportional to the number density squared. So they're proportional to the number density of um, the first species and the species it's colliding with. And because these two terms are just the mixing ratio of species one times by the total number density of the atmosphere, these processes go with the square of the number density. And so that means that these opacity sources dominate at high pressures. So if you imagine, for example, that you, you have a hypothetical atmosphere and you look at a wavelength where no molecules absorb, you won't be able to see all the way down to the core of the planet because at high enough pressures, this squared dependence makes collision induced absorption come into play. And so this always sets as essentially the maximum depth that you can probe in a spectrum, which might be something like uh, one bar for an emission spectrum or 100 millibars for transmission. So it's very important to include this continuum in your models. And it turns out that this is actually immensely helpful for retrievals to constrain absolute abundances, because um, this essentially breaks a symmetry in the spectrum by putting in a flaw in the spectrum that is independent of the mixing ratios of species like uh, water, for example. So CIA, collision-induced absorption, is a vital contribution to atmospheric models.
And uh, this is uh, the last slide that I have here in part two. This is just to illustrate a, a plot showing cross sections of various molecules, atoms, and ions. So we see, for example, that at visible wavelengths, species like the metal oxides, titanium oxide and vanadium oxide, have huge cross sections, and that's due to um, these sodium and potassium doublets. And so um, that's why it's so easy to detect things like sodium and potassium. And TIO and VO, we've heard thermal inversions mentioned in previous talks, and we'll see more in part uh, two, part three, sorry, that these species um, can cause thermal inversions by just gobbling up all of the photons in the, the optical and the near UV, and hence warming up the upper atmosphere. So, okay, so uh, now I'm going to uh, hand back to Natasha for our uh, second tutorial, where we're now going to uh, look at the contributions of opacities from various different species. And please do let me know if there are any questions on anything that uh, I said, by the way. Yeah, does anyone have any questions for Ryan? I can't see any, I think we're good. Okay, um, so we have about 40 more minutes. Um, so this next uh, half is really, so in the first, first part, we were really just looking at sort of these spectra, which are a little bit hard to dissect um, and getting an understanding for the chemistry that is going into those models. Um, I told you before, that although we you know, started out looking at all these really nice chemical models, we really are focused on, now when we're looking at the spectra, we're really gonna be focused on the molecules of which we're, we actually have those cross sections as Ryan was showing. Um, so you, you know, when you're, um, by looking at the mixing ratios, you might think, oh, you know, I have a high abundance of something, therefore I should automatically see it. Uh, unfortunately, that's not always the case. There's a lot of other factors that go into whether or not you're actually going to be able to observe something, aside from whether or not it just has a high abundance. Um, the first, first component is just, do you have enough spectral resolution to resolve the features? Uh, what do the features look like? Are they really broad, you know, row vibrational brands, or are they narrow? Um, the, the second is just, are you looking in the white, white, right wavelength region? Uh, one of the key things of, uh, of modeling or the key intuitions that you can gain is just really understanding, you know, sort of broadly where you expect features to be, especially really prominent ones uh, like the 1.4 micron water band that just uh, kind of show up time and time again. And then the last component is, you know, Ryan just showed this really nice plot of all of these different, you know, molecular opacity contributions. And if you kind of stared at that for a while, you might notice that some opacity, some uh, molecular features kind of start, kind of look like other molecular features. Uh, and sometimes that becomes very tricky if you're looking at a narrow wavelength region and you really only have that specific narrow wavelength region to go off of, you can start to confound different molecular uh, features for each other. And so, you know, kind of dissecting what other molecules might be absorbing in a similar similar wavelength region to the, to the you know to the wavelength space that you're looking at and the specific molecule that you're interested in at is also a huge component of sort of dissecting these spectra. Um, within Picasso there's this really nice function called get contribution which doesn't actually compute your spectra for you but what it'll do is it'll output uh, some of these optical components or optical depth components that can be really useful for sort of dissecting some of these components. Um, so the first thing is just a bilayer optical depth of every single absorbing species. Uh, and so this will give you sort of the, the optical depth that you have in any given atmospheric layer. One thing that, um, you know, Ryan was showing these nice integrals, but when we go to actually compute the um, spectra, we do everything sort of on a layer by layer component. So we sort of split the atmosphere and compute the, the, in, the integral like that. Um, the third component is the cumulative optical depth. So this is if uh, you know, you're, you're, you're starting at the top of the atmosphere and now you're gonna sum the opacity as sort of you get deeper. And so you're going to get this really nice increase in, in optical depth as you sort of go towards um, 
to go towards higher pressures. And, and then the last one is this optical depth, this tau one surface. And so if you, the, the tau one surface is if you, um, I, uh, actually I'm not gonna create a plot, but if you were to, if you were to think of the optical depth as sort of continuous increasing profile as you go towards higher pressures, um, at some point you're gonna reach around optical depth of about one. Um, this is a really critical point because above one, you're, you're relatively optically thin and below one, you're, you're optically thick. And so the region that we really care about, the region that you're really seeing, um, that you're really sensitive to is this sort of optical depth one region. And so one way that we can start to diagnose our, our spectra to really understand what's going on is by looking at these, what I call tau, tau one surfaces um, for each individual molecule. And so uh, if you have your notebook working, uh, so below, I, I'm just going to plot the two extremes. Remember, we talked about these different temperature regimes, uh, the below 500 Kelvin, around 1,000 Kelvin, where you have these really sharp transition points, and then above um, 2,000 Kelvin, where you start to get all these metals. Um, so here, it's you're going to do the same exact thing that you did before, except for now you're going to, instead of doing the dot spectrum function, you're just going to use the get contribution function. And we're going to plot out the, the optical depth surface at tau of one. Um, and I'm just going to do that for two different cases here, case one, case two, just so that we can compare. Um, and then here you can see all I'm doing is taking the mean. So we're sort of looking at a, a low resolution version of this uh, and then plotting out the, the spectra. Um, and, and again, this is now uh, parsed out by by molecule. And so here is the cold, here is the, uh, the cold case. And by cold, uh, just to remind myself, I chose this 400 Kelvin object. And so you can sort of, you know, already see the, the main components of what we were talking about earlier. Um, we, we saw lots of H2 and helium in that, in that mixing ratio plot. And those two things you can immediately see as these continuum induced absorption, those properties that Ryan was talking about. Um, so those are, you can see those in this plot here, this town one surface. Um, the next thing that comes up very prominently is the water which again is exactly what you would expect given those mixing ratio plots that we were looking at earlier. Water was sort of present at all temperatures. Um, and then you can see the methane. Um, the methane is sort of in equal, uh, is providing sort of an equal contribution to the, to the water um, and exhibiting some very large spectral features. And we can sort of zoom in here to see what's going on, what's going on in here. So here I have a huge methane feature that is sort of popping up right at around 3.1 microns. Um, and in between this water feature and this methane feature, you can actually see, start to see a little bit of ammonia coming up as well. Um, and so this is kind of a very interesting region. The way that you might see this in an actual spectrum is sort of the, um, in a very simplistic sense, sort of, you know, you might expect your spectrum to sort of look like a, you know, have a sort of quadruple peak here. Um, and if we go up, we might now look at, let's revisit some of our spectra above and see if we can identify that behavior in sort of in some of these cooler regions. And that is kind of indeed what you see here. Um, remember before we were looking at, um, you know, just the, the regular 1.4 micron water band, and it looks sort of very pure if you go to the very hotter regions. But as you go to the cooler regions, now you start to see that this water band, something is interfering with these bands and you're getting these multiple peaked, uh, multiple peaked features. And so when you look at this, it's actually not just a single band that you're seeing. Um, what this get contribution function is showing is that there's sort of multiple 
uh, multiple features that are sort of interfering or sort of adding up to create your spectrum. And CO, as we would expect, because of that drop off in chemistry, is well below these, these contributing regions. And so although CO is contributing opacity at these high, um, at these very hot temperatures, you're not going to see that at all uh, because, you know, um, because it's so down far below where these other molecules are becoming optically thick. Does that make sense to everyone? Cool. And it, now going over here to the, to the hotter objects, we can address that question of where was the CO band? Um, and so you can see that the first thing you might notice, and I, I think I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm totally giving away all of the questions, but um, the first thing you might notice is the, the difference in continuum op opacity. Um, for, for the colder objects, we really were only seeing some of the, some of the H2, H2 opacity and the H2 helium. Um, but now as we go towards hotter objects where you can actually ionize some of this hydrogen, you're, you're now seeing some of that, um, H minus bound free opacity that, that Ryan showed at the end of that plot. Um, it's actually just really creeping in there. Um, you can see there's only just a small hint of it um, right at one point, uh, one and a half microns, uh, right where uh, this TIO molecular band is experiencing a drop. And so there are these really kind of key regions, especially um, part of the reason why this the CIA is so important is that there are these sort of window regions where you get a drop off in molecular opacity and if you can actually see the continuum that's going to help a lot in your retrieval and so this would be sort of a key region where you might see that really sharp cutoff in um, in a molecular band so the other thing that you're of course seeing is the the tio and via and vo opacity VO is actually way down here, so you're not really seeing it specifically in this hot spectrum, um, but you are, but you are certainly seeing the, the TIO specifically towards sort of the optical regions. Um, and it looks like uh, the alkalis have also appeared, but they're wet, they're very much at depth. And so in these hotter regions. Uh, for this hotter spectra, you're really only sensitive to the water opacity. Uh, and then this really, this really small um, CO feature that, that sort of pops in here at, at 4.5-ish 4, 4. Um, 4. microns. And so someone asked earlier about why the, the hot spectra were appearing as black bodies. And so one really useful thing, especially for the emission spectra, is to look at the, the flux of your spectrum um, compared to black bodies along the pressure temperature profile, right? Because you can think of this tau one surface as sort of where the flux will be primarily emanating from. And so here we can see that most of the flux that we're sensitive to along the spectrum from you know, about one to 14 microns is around a bar to a tenth of a bar. You know, it's kind of, kind of fixed in this region. And so we can plot for this, um, you know, for this hotter case here, the, the, a black body at a bar a tenth of a bar, and I'm just going to put here, um, uh, you know, a hundredth of a bar. And um, and you'll have to copy this if you're following along in the collab because I just added this based on on the question that was asked. Um, and I can make this here a bit bigger. 
Um, and so here you have, here you have um, the, our, this is the raw flux output. This is our spectrum. And here we have these different black bodies. So at a hundredth of a bar, um, you're really only sensitive to the, the hundredth of a bar at sort of key regions. Um, and actually it sort of looks like it's approaching about a hundredth of a bar um, towards very long wavelengths. Um, also towards these very long wavelengths, you're sort of at the tail end of this black body. And so you're, you're starting to sort of approximate the black body um, past about five microns. And then below five microns, you're sort of sensitive to anything from about a tenth of a bar to about a hundred, or you know, actually well below that, um, but sort of in this region here. And that's really, um, you can really see you're kind of just moving up and down this curve here and becoming sensitive to these different regions along your pressure temperature profile. And I think for the next about three minutes, um, I would encourage you to go um, to look at sort of uh, a different region here. I'm going to go through and compare a 400 Kelvin to, I'm going to switch this up and do a thousand Kelvin. Um, we we saw previously that the 1,000 Kelvin region was a sort of interesting region where you start to get this uh, increase in, um, it, you know, this divide between this, the, the carbon monoxide and the methane. Um, and there we go. And so now this is the 400 Kelvin region and this is the 1000 Kelvin region. Um, and one thing that I just wanted to point out in these last two minutes is I wanted to talk about the, um, the difference in the methane. Um, can someone, I'm gonna isolate here a methane feature uh, and, and apologies, the, the color scales are different on these. So you're looking at this um, green curve here uh, and comparing it to, let's look at, at this blue curve here. What's a, what's a sort of very, just a simple difference that you see between this green curve and the blue curve? You can also just unmute yourself as typing is taking too long because people have been typing for quite a while. Well, I'm noting the y axis is actually different as well. So your methane really goes up towards higher temperatures, high up in the yeah. atmosphere. I mean. mm -hmm. Yep, that's definitely one, one aspect. The, the other, oh, sorry, go for it. The peak feature in the blue curve, like it goes up and then shoots mm -hmm. up, up. Yeah, so so in this kind of hotter case, you're seeing the you're really seeing the sort of fundamental shape of the methane band, whereas you might not be seeing it as strongly in this in this case. There's one more one more aspect, and I'll give people a few more minutes before we. Uh, Bibiana is raising her hand. Go yeah, ahead. I was just wondering, would you mind plugging in a higher value than this 2000 instead of like putting the 1000 in there? So I'm sort of like interested what is happening if you plug in, I don't know, 2600 or 3000 Kelvin instead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can. Um, because I, I didn't get the notebook running in the end. So I had some problem ah, with some gotcha. path. So otherwise I would have done it myself. So I figured. <laughs> um, Totally. I will do that in just one second. Um, in the the one the one point that I wanted to make just about this um, specific regime here is the one difference you might notice with the methane is here you're seeing the full 
shape of the methane band, you're actually seeing the bottom. Um, and so methane is contributing opacity even you know, to around, well, a little bit less than 10 bars. Here, you're not seeing that. You're actually seeing these really steep cliffs. The methane opacity contribution drops off dramatically. And this is, um, it kind of looks like, you know, at first glance, you might think, oh, this is just the line list. Um, but actually what's happening here is because we're at this really critical regime, if you look at the, if we were to look at um, the pressure temperature profile around this region of a thousand Kelvin, oh, putting why it's not my forte. Um, as we, as we go towards cooler temperatures, you hit this 1,000 Kelvin region right at around a tenth of a bar. And so methane is actually not present below at hotter temperatures. And so instead of seeing sort of this tail drop off where you're getting opacity from the window regions of the methane band, you actually see this really dramatic drop off and this step function kind of increases dr dramatically to a point where you're getting optical contribution that sort of flickers on right at a tenth of a bar. Um, and you can see that really prominently in the pressure temperature profile as well. And so it's kind of interesting just from looking at these sort of contribution plots, you can start to sort of pinpoint um, what the pressure temperature profile is doing without even actually looking at the, the pressure temperature profile at all. Um, and so I think that is that is an interesting note. And then just to address your question, so you wanted me to go hotter. So let's go up to, let's say, 2,500. And I see we're just at the 15 minute mark. So um, Brian, I would, uh, we probably, OK, here we go. Um, so this looks a little bit similar to what the, I think I had done 2000. So it's not much different. Um, you can see that the water opacity has actually just increased. And now the CO is a little bit below the water. Um, though if we, did I do, I think I did like a 2300 Kelvin one. Uh, oh, this is the one that we were looking at here. Um, even though it is primarily just water, if we kind of try and look at this four micron region, it actually is quite hard to tell whether or not we're even seeing the CO. It looks like maybe we're not and we're just seeing that water opacity. Um, but the one thing to remember is that this, um, this opacity database that I gave you is sort of a condensed version. Um, and uh, and, and so in reality, you need, you would, if you were really computing these sort of really hot temperature planets, you would want to make sure that you had those metals, um, you know, and all these other, these other interesting absorbers that are popping up because those would certainly be there. Um, and that's especially why like uh, looking at these plots before you do any of your modeling is so important because it really gives you an idea for what opacities you need to make sure you have in your model. And then there was a question about uh, what temperatures do you predict inversions to become important? Um, that's a really interesting question. Um, TIO and VO are sometimes um, responsible for temperature inversions as they heat up the upper atmosphere. And so you might expect temperature inversions to sort of flicker on when you see um, large contributions from TIO and VO, and VO which um, in this plot, it looks like um, the way that I'm computing, the way that I'm grabbing these, um, these mixing ratios, it looks like it's not popping up here, but that's something that you would be able to see from this plot. So we're at 15 minutes. I'm gonna hand it back to Ryan so he can do the last uh, section of the lecture. Um, we're unfortunately not gonna get to the cloud portion, um, but, or, or the, the observing modes portion, um, but feel free to ping me with any questions. Thank, thank you very much again, Natasha. Okay, and don't worry everyone, the last part 
is very quick, so uh, we shall be on time. Okay. Right, so uh, now we're going to uh, complete our journey in um, talking about the last few parts that we haven't mentioned in constructing a model atmosphere. Okay, so looking again at the optical depth, which we need to be able to solve the equation of radius transfer, we've seen now how you can calculate the um, cross sections and where they all come from that feed into the extinction coefficient. But we see that there is also the number densities of the various different gases. So once we know the mixing ratios, which come from chemistry, either chemical equilibrium or disequilibrium models, like we saw earlier, usually um, you can make the assumption of the ideal gas law, which makes everything very simple, because then the total number density at any layer in the atmosphere is just the pressure divided by the Boltzmann constant times by the temperature in the layer. And then we multiply by the mixing uh, ratio of the particular species, and that then tells us the number densities of all of the species in the atmosphere. The ideal gas law is a very good approximation for pretty much every region that's going to be strongly absorbing in exoplanet atmospheres. Um, okay, and but then to be able to work out this ds here, we need to know what is the either vertical extent of each of the layers in the case of emission spectra or the, uh, the slant path through the atmosphere in the case of transmission spectra. So we need to be able to work out what the radial or vertical spacing of each of the layers is in the atmosphere. And so for this, we can solve the equation of hydrostatic equilibrium, which relates the pressure in a layer to the radius, um, assuming an inverse square law uh, gravity. So the solution to this is um, accounting for the inverse square law dependence of gravity, uh, which is important, as we heard earlier in the uh, Petit Radtrans tutorial, is given by this expression here. So what you can see is that to work out both the number densities and the radial profiles, we need to have a prescription that tells us what the temperature in each layer of the atmosphere is. Once we know this, we can solve these equations, put that into there, we know the cross sections, and then we can propagate back through all of the previous slides and then work out our spectrum. So the last thing we really need to know is the temperature profile. So there are many approaches that you can take to figure out the temperature profile. Um, we heard earlier in some of the tutorials about parameterizations that you can use, and they are very commonly used in retrievals. You just have a functional form described by some numbers and then just let the data tell you what those numbers are. Another approach you can take, which is the forward modeling approach, is to start from fundamental principles of physics and try and work out what the temperature profile should be. So we call these self-consistent pressure temperature profiles. So what you can imagine, for example, is you can have a model atmosphere with a certain incident flux hitting the top of the atmosphere coming from the star, you can have an internal flux coming from the internal temperature at the bottom of the atmosphere propagating upwards. And then you can solve the, um, you can solve the equation of radiative convective equilibrium or the equation of radiative convective equilibrium to work out how radiation propagates through the atmosphere. And then as each layer in the atmosphere absorbs radiation, it will heat up and when it emits, it will cool down. And so by stepping through an iterative procedure, you can work out what the temperature must be in all the layers of the atmosphere to be consistent with the incident radiation, the radiation from the bottom of the atmosphere, and the opacities all throughout the atmosphere. So here in this nice plot from Jayesh Goyal in the paper last year, you see, for example, that for the same planet, but with um, different chemistry, I think this might actually be a different equilibrium temperature, you can get a remarkable difference in the pressure temperature profile depending on the chemistry. So here we see a thermal inversion where um, with increasing altitude, the temperature increases in this particular layer. So this is caused by species like TIO and VO that we mentioned previously. Generally, any species that has a very strong cross section in the optical and then weak cross sections in the infrared can cause an inversion. So it's not limited to metal oxides. There are metal hydrides and things like uh, iron or even H minus and things can also cause inversions. 
So that's what we see here for a self-consistent model. And you can see that the different regions of the atmosphere have different physics going on. So the deep atmosphere has an adiabat coming from convection dominating what's going on. And you also get a region where radiation is, um, photons are diffusing through the atmosphere. There's a whole lot of physics that goes into computing these models. And that's incidentally why retrievals often just parameterize this, because it's very computationally intensive to enforce radiative convective equilibrium. So everything we've spoken about so far is basically being focused on one dimensional models. So I just wanted to allude to the fact that um, apparently planets are, are not one dimensional. They're actually uh, three dimensional objects. So you can, for example, also have self-consistent models um, become general circulation models that can self-consistently work out the pressure temperature profile and also account for things like winds that will advect energy from the day side to the night side and hence drive these temperature gradients. And when you solve hydrostatic equilibrium in the different longitude and latitude columns in the atmosphere, that also means that the temperature on the day side at the top of the atmosphere is uh, higher or throughout the column, and hence the top of atmosphere radius will be higher on the day side than the night side. This is to scale in this animation that you see here. So you see the night side um, has a much lower radial extent. And this can actually be important in radio transfer models in uh, 2D and 3D as well. Incidentally, this is a GCM model for the ultra hot Jupiter HAT P7b, um, originally computed by Vivian Parmentier and from this paper by Christiane Helling. So um, it's just worth bearing in mind that although a lot of the focus of the models that we've spoken about so far have been in one dimension, 2D and 3D effects can also be important and will likely prove even more important with um, the new high resolution spectrographs that we're getting and also James Webb that should be going up uh, very, very soon. Uh, the very last model component that uh, we haven't covered up to this point is aerosols. And this is a catch-all term basically for um, clouds and hazes. So it can be um, clouds we're obviously very familiar with on Earth. So these are condensates, for example. Uh, hazes can be a very light suspension of small particles that can very strongly scatter light. So things like the tholins that are seen in Titan's upper atmosphere. So in a very simplistic picture, at least in transmission geometry, because uh, clouds have, uh, due to the geometry, they have much less of an effect in emission spectrum. You can imagine a cloud just destroys any photon that is instant on them. They're almost like a brick wall, while hazes have a wavelength dependence. So the smaller the wavelength of light, the closer to the characteristic particle size, light interacts more prominently and scatters out the beam. And so you can imagine a simple model, for example, like, OK, well, every pressure that is deeper than the uh, cloud top pressure, we're just going to lose all photons that strike the cloud. While for a haze, we effectively get something that looks a little bit like Rayleigh scattering, but can have a different power law dependence, uh, depending on the strength of the scattering of the haze. So for low resolution spectra, these very simplistic cloud models basically um, put in a new surface that cuts off the, uh, the base of absorption features in transmission spectra for a cloud deck, while for hazes, it looks a little bit like Rayleigh scattering, but with a different slope and with a different characteristic strength, at least for these very, very simple cloud models. You can have more physically realistic clouds. For example, you can account for the physics of me scattering and um, like what we see in this uh, nice paper from Bjorn Benecke, if you have a me scattering cloud shown by this uh, dashed curve here, um, no cloud will be opaque at every wavelength throughout the entire electromagnetic spectrum. So a cloud that absorbs in the optical will not absorb all light in the radio, for example. So in fact, uh, the theory of me scattering predicts that at wavelengths which are uh, much greater than the characteristic particle size of uh, the aerosol, the opacity rapidly falls off. And this may have already been seen in the case of this um, uh, sub-Neptune here, GJ 3470b, where the Spitzer transit depths are much lower than the Hubble with C3 transit depths. And um, you can even run retrievals that include me scattering in them and statistically constrain what the particle size, the average particle size must be to be able to explain a fall off like this. Um, 
the extinction coefficient, as you might guess, becomes a little bit more complicated. So you have to use, um, so me scattering theory actually lets you analytically work out um, what the, um, the me efficiencies are, this factor Q. They depend on the composition of the aerosol. So things like the complex refractive index M here and the size of the particle that is scattering light. You then integrate this, which is for a single particle size over a particle size distribution, because any realistic aerosol will have a whole range of different particle sizes. So here, for example, is a log normal particle size distribution. And then you multiply this by the number density profile of the, um, the aerosol. So clouds will tend to have many more particles near the cloud base, and then it will fall off with altitude. So this is just to give you a taste of more physically realistic cloud models and how they can impact on spectra. So unfortunately, we don't have time to kind of go into the um, last part of the collab there. Um, so we're going to uh, stop there. And um, I see we do have an extra couple minutes or so. So if any of you have any questions on anything that we have uh, covered today, I know we've covered a lot of ground there and that was just a very um, quick tour. I just wanted to you to get an idea, hopefully, of all the different components that go into these um, templates. They're a little bit less magical now, hopefully. So yeah, feel free to either unmute or if you have any questions, you can type them in the chat. And um, Natasha and I will also be checking Slack afterwards in case you have any questions that you want to uh, raise there. And definitely check out the last parts of the collab because uh, there are some like really cool features that Natasha put in there, especially with the observing mode and seeing with instruments on James Webb, like where we'll be able to observe certain molecules and how clouds make our life a bit harder. Polina, go ahead. Hi, thank you for the lecture. Um, yeah, it was very long, but very interesting, all the different parts. So I just was wondering, uh, how does the molecular features change with age? Like, do we expect that the planets at, at a certain age like stay more or less the same? Or like, will this be changing? Like, I don't know. So, Natasha, could you maybe get the sequence of models that you were showing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let me share my screen. Actually, there is a whole tutorial that might be interesting to you. Um, so the Sagan School this year was actually dedicated to the spectroscopy of young planets. And so there is a tutorial um, that actually loads in some evolution curves, um, depending on these different formation scenarios. And so the, as the planet ages, it cools, either following one of these tracks, um, depending on what these are, uh, these colors represent the different masses of the of, uh, initial start masses of the planets. And so the sort of sequence that we were looking today from sort of very hot to cool is kind of mimics the sequence of going from sort of younger objects to cooler objects. Um, but it's, it's, it's very interesting to consider sort of these different sort of formation scenarios. And so if you're interested in that, you can check this out uh, and, and, and play around with not just looking at sort of a, an equal sequence from cool to hot, but actually considering, uh, you know, an actual um, evolutionary track. Oh, very, very interesting. Yeah, I will check that later. Thank you. Maybe we could also link that uh, in the Slack channel. And I will also post a PDF of my slides in the Slack channel as well, if you want to uh, pour over the equations to your heart's content. All right, last chance for some questions. Because otherwise we're incredibly on time. I'm so impressed with yeah, both of you. I'm going to make you not be on time. Oh, yes. Of course, Jens, of all people. Um, I think all these models sort of predict 
predict uh, emergent spectra, transmission or emission, assuming that the planet is a one dimensional object. Uh, James Webb is going to launch very soon. To what extent do you expect that all of this is going to break once our planets become, or once our detail becomes good enough for, for, for 3D effects essentially to start to kick in really in our spectrum? Yeah, all, all the 1D models are going to be wrong. Um, yeah, e even with the, the low resolution um, spectra that we'll get, I mean, even like for some, for some planets, like even like Hubble spectra are kind of pushing at where like 2D effects become important. So especially um, in transmission geometry, for example, the, um, especially for ultra hot Jupiters, the difference in the path length between the day side and the night side that you go between can make a huge difference. You can get chemical composition gradients between the morning and evening terminators. All of these effects are going to become like really important. That being said, like if you have a 2D or 3D atmosphere that contains water on any part of the atmosphere that is probed, you will still see a water absorption feature in the spectrum. And if you try and fit it with a one dimensional model, you'll get the water abundance a little wrong, but you won't inadvertently detect the wrong species. Uh, the 2D and 3D effects don't tend to like distort the features enough that you like accidentally put in another species. So the detections will still be fine, but if we really want to be confident on the abundances, um, it is going to matter that we include the 2D and 3D effects. And there's a lot of work uh, that many people, including myself, are doing to uh, prepare for that. I will also say that a lot of the 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 transmit or like the emission, like Picasso, for instance, and I think many other radiative transfer models out there operate in a similar way. But there is there usually we assume we we like to use symmetry in modeling because it speeds things up. Um, and so a lot of times we assume symmetry and only compute, you know, um, uh, compute the integral of the disk using a few points and using a single PT profile. But there are, you know, you can you can start to sort of get rid of symmetry if you think that you have 3D effects and use sort of different PT profiles for different regions of the planet. You can imagine sort of splitting this up into maybe two concentric circles or something like that. Um, and so I don't think all hope is lost. I think that our models are kind of set up to incorporate, uh, you know, pseudo 3D effects, uh, specifically when getting out abundances and things like that. I said, and sorry if I conveyed like hopelessness, it's an opportunity. <laughs> We're going to be able to extract from our spectra 2D and 3D effects. It's going to be amazing. Uh, many of us theorists will be like panicking a little bit, but like it'll be the right level of panic to ensure that we learn a huge amount of these planets in uh, the next couple of years. Brilliant, thank you. All right, otherwise a few people appreciating your hard work today. Um, thank you very much. That was uh, impressive to pack all of that in two hours. And um, that's uh, the end of our workshop section. And tomorrow we'll start, sorry, of our hands-on uh, section in the last two days. And tomorrow we'll start with the workshop. So I hope everybody has their slides ready and done. And um, I'll see you tomorrow afternoon slash morning slash late evening, depending where you are in the world. Just one last one last point before we all go. Um, so remember that there is a new Zoom link for the, for, for the next three days, which was already sent out, but I guess I will again send it tomorrow uh, before, before the conference proper starts. Um, uh, they... Um, the, the videos of the tu uh, tutorials from yesterday are already on YouTube, on, an, on a YouTube uh, channel. I have put all the materials from the lectures of yesterday are already on just single GitHub repository in case you want to have all the other all stuff from one place apart from uh, Jens because his stuff was too big and I couldn't fit all the, all the harps uh, spectra, but the link is, uh, in, is in the readme file in, in his uh, GitHub uh, repository, so you know where to go. I will do the same for all the lectures today, but uh, uploading hundreds and hundreds of megabytes onto YouTube is not, is not that quick, so <laughs> please have some patience. And at the end, I hope, I hope you all really enjoyed enjoyed these lectures. And hope and the idea is that then the next three days, when you actually when we actually have talks, then hopefully things make a little bit more sense when people are showing these uh, Picasso type uh, velocity velocity plots plots from CCF maps. Now it kind of makes a little bit more sense. Uh, 
or uh, when, when people are talking about uh, atmospheric models and retrievals, the same. So that was, that was the idea. And um, yeah, obviously we keep the conversation going. The Slack channel remains open. And um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. And, and at the end, also a big, huge thank you to all the, all the lecturers. Uh, the preparation was far beyond anything that I had in my wildest imagination. So thank you all for spending all the time preparing. It was really great. Then if not, we'll, we'll close the session and uh, we'll see you all tomorrow at the same time. Take care.